writers, you're listening to the Kobo Writing Life Podcast, where we bring you insights and inspiration for growing your self-publishing business, coming to you from Kobo's headquarters in Toronto. Hi everyone, welcome to the Kobo Writing Life Podcast. I'm Stephanie. And I'm Chrissy, and in this week's episode, I interviewed Damon Swade, who is a remarkably talented author and writing teacher, and we talk specifically about two of his books on both craft and marketing, and those topics and pieces of advice are extremely interesting and inspiring. Damon comes from a theater background, so he brings some super interesting advice just from that unique perspective. For example, if you are thinking about creating a character, think about it in terms of budgeting a movie, right? If you're going to bring in a new character, you are thinking minimally six figures to hire a person. Yeah, so... Every single character and scene change should be totally essential to your story. My mind's blown. But when you break it down that way, you know, everything has to serve a purpose or else you're wasting your reader's time. Yeah, right? I haven't listened to this episode yet, but now you I'm ready to, to go. <laughs> so all kinds of advice like that. So he did a talk at RWA on this very topic on how he builds characters and how he bases them around actions specifically every character is driven by a specific verb you have to verbalize your uh, characters and blew the minds of all of these (laughs) romance authors who are like we don't think that way that's not how we build characters and has really inspired a lot of authors so I'm super thrilled to bring his techniques and advice to this listenership I think a lot of you if you haven't heard Damon speak or read his books will be really inspired to maybe change the way you think about craft But I do want to note that uh, we do talk about sex, and there are some swear words in this episode. So if you're listening with young kids or you don't like to hear some swear words, this might be an episode you want to skip. But we get into some really interesting topics also about romance as a genre opening up to exploring different kinds of relationships. He is... One of the first, I think the first actually, person to top Amazon charts with a male-male romance and to prove that different shapes of relationships and love storylines don't have to fit in what you would imagine to be a traditional romance. And now we see that all over the place on the romance charts. So we cover a lot of ground. I loved this conversation. Like I said, Damon has so much fascinating advice and we will share the links to his two books on the blog because I highly recommend that every writer read these two books super super great content there so I hope you love listening to this episode as much as I loved recording it Damon Swade welcome to the Kobo Writing Life podcast and thank you so much for your time today thank you so much for having me on So I met you at Novelist Inc. in Florida in November, where you were presenting on a bunch of topics, but I believe intimacy is the one that I was hearing people talk about. Mm -hmm. I did a, they actually asked me to come down about a year and a half ago. And when they approached me, they said, well, what do you want to teach? And I said, I will, I'm like an old hooker. Like I will teach out of my purse. So what is the topic that you don't have covered? And, um, and they were sort of working out the schedule. And I said, listen, I've been teaching for 30 years. I was like, pick the topic that there's a gap for. And so when they came back, they were like, we want you to teach. It was the funniest thing. They said, we want you to teach blurbs and sex scenes. And I was like, that's the <laughs> weirdest combo of all time. But I was like, sure, I would love to talk about blurbs and sex scenes. And it wound up going, it went beautifully. I was really, really happy. Like I had such a fun time. It's a really different crowd from the Mm -hmm. other writing events I've done. But although they were a very strange concatenation of topics, they wound up kind of going together really well. So ironically, blurbs and sex scenes have more in common than you would think. I taught them, I I should make clear, I taught them at different times. I was going to say, please tell me this was one session. (laughs) No, no, no. That's amazing. (laughs) But ironically, a lot of it is about exciting emotion and giving people an emotional release and all that stuff. (laughs) So there is definitely some resonance between the two, but they were a day and a half apart. Okay. 
Okay, I'll take it. So for our listeners who were not as lucky as myself and the other attendees of NINC, um, can we just get a quick background on you? You already mentioned you've been teaching writing for 30 years, but you also write fiction yourself. How did you get from, from there to here in the last three decades? <laughs> so I started out as a child, I had a freak singing voice. And <laughs> I, I promise not to do a hideous backstory, but I had a freak singing voice. And so I'd started doing musicals when I was very young and that led to Shakespeare. And then, so I was a schmactor for a long time, which is a combination of schmuck and actor. Mm -hmm. And I was in London doing a show and a producer came and said, I want you to write a play for me. And I had done a little bit of stuff, but I sort of fell into playwriting and then won a bunch of awards for playwriting. And then I sort of fell into screenwriting because Robert De Niro and, and the people at Tribeca, Tribeca Productions, and then from them, Fox Animated Features, hired me to start doing movies and then television and then a bunch of other stuff. And so in the course of sort of screenwriting and scripting, I also started working for Marvel and for DC and I worked in comics. And all of this was sort of chugging along and I was making my way. And then in 2009, my husband, who is a forensic investigator, was out of town on a case. And I had a friend who was working on an erotic romance and she was stuck. And at the time, I was actually finishing up a paper offline. And uh, it's like a virtual edit on a film that I'd been hired to do. And so I was just basically in my house crying and masturbating. And, and she said, oh, can you help me with this story? And I said, sure. She called me. And we were sort of bopping the story back and forth. And about 20 minutes in, she said, if you don't write a romance novel, you are the laziest asshole I've ever met. And I was like, <laughs> what are you talking about? And she said, you love the genre. You have so much fun when you talk about it. Why aren't you writing romance? And I was like, because I write scripts. I don't, that's not what I do. And she said, I dare you, which is the worst thing you can say to me. She said, I dare right. you. You would finish it in two months. You would have so much fun. And Jeffrey was out of town. And so I literally got off the phone with her and I thought about it and I knew exactly the story I should use. And I wrote my first romance novel in six weeks. I sold it in two days and then it was number one on Amazon for six months. And it wow. broke all these crazy records. And I was in the top 100 for all romance fiction and out of nowhere, right? I'd come out of nowhere as far as the romance community was concerned. But of course I'd been writing for 27 years. And so I had this weird bag of tricks that kind of dovetailed very nicely into romance because it's all about relationships, right? Mm -hmm. and, and sort of cultivating an emotional roller coaster, and which I love anyway as a reader. And so because of that, and because of the success of that first book, I called my legit agent. I called the agent that handled me for entertainment, for scripts, etc. And I was like, dude, I want to go write novels. And he was like, what are you talking about? And then I showed him, I showed him my royalty statements and he was like, I fully agree. And I was like, I never want to work for the Weinsteins again. They're disgusting. I'm going to go over here and write genre fiction. And it became like a love affair. Like I had yeah. so much fun and the fans were so loving and the, my colleagues were so cool. I'd never worked in an industry where people wanted you to succeed. Like in film, everyone wants to kill you and rape your corpse. And in romance, everyone's like, how do I get you out into the world? So I start writing romance. This is in 2011. And at the same time, because I'd been writing for so long, you know, I taught classes off and on for probably 10 years at that point, just because I was a successful screenwriter. And, mm -hmm. and so in the romance community, again, there's this sort of general communal sense that everybody kind of gives back. And so I obviously like our WG, same with Writers Guild, I joined RWA because that's what you do, right? You join the right. guild. And as part of my chapter, they said, oh, if you ever want to teach a class. And I was like, oh, God, I got classes out the yin-yang. What do you want me to teach? And I started teaching, and then I started kind of building a reputation as a solid teacher. And then that led to me traveling a lot. And actually, last year, Jeffrey and I just figured out, I was in 39 different cities last year for wow. either romance events, meaning like publicity events, or and or for teaching. Because I've taught for so long, and I have this sort of list of classes. Well, he, two years ago, three years ago, something, I did a class with Kristen Higgins in San Diego. Mm -hmm. It was Kristen, Farrah Rashawn, and I. And I did 20 minutes on this character technique that came from when I had been working in screenwriting. And the audience went berserk. I only spoke for 20 minutes, but this recording went viral. And everyone was like, oh, my God, I've never heard of this. This changes everything. And I was like, everybody works this way. And they said, no, 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 no one works this way. You're insane. <laughs> And Kristen started nagging me. She was like, write the book, write the book. And that's how Verbalize got written. It's funny because it all sort of happened seamlessly, but 
through no agency of my own in that weird lightning strike way, right? It just yeah. sort of happened. Absolutely. So there are a bunch of things I want to get into out of everything you just said. But I don't, really, I barfed. I apologize. I just barfed. <laughs> Excuse me for a moment. <laughs> I want to talk about the character building that you did explain in that original presentation and then in verbalize, which I had the chance to read in prepping for this conversation. What is unique about that approach? What do you think works about it? So um, how deep do you want me to go? I mean, I think I should ask you, how deep do you want me to go? Let's go for it. Okay. All in. So I think that most writers, when they start writing, use what other people use. So if you pick up a writing guide right now, if you go into any bookstore in America, any library, and you pick up a book on how to write insert genre, right, or how to create a screenplay, you will get one of four or five different boilerplate descriptions of how you create a character. And they're all bullshit. But they're actually not, I shouldn't say they're bullshit. They're useful, but they're like useful later in the process. But none of them actually have anything to do with writing a character. The reason for that is that when mass market entertainment happened and mass market publishing happened, the entertainment landscape was under sort of siege from psychology, from the rise of psychology. And by that I mean everyone became obsessed with the idea that Hamlet could be explained by the main character's feelings about his mom. Or they became obsessed with a group of structuralist anthropologists that said all myths are one myth. Joseph Campbell, we can explain everything by a series of archetypes. Or they said, actually, we can use psychological theories and these models like Myers-Briggs or like color theory, like the Enneagram, whatever, we can explain character. And so we're going to set up these archetypes and we're going to follow these archetypes. Mm -hmm. And the truth is all of those are based on extrapolation. Meaning if I say to you, write me a Korean soprano who's an IFTJ, you actually can't write that. You can't actually write Korean. You can't actually write soprano. You can't write IFTJ. The, the thing is, those are details, and from those details, you can extrapolate. The only thing you can actually write on the page is words. Now, the irony is when I started writing characters, I was an actor. And as an actor, you have to act. You have to take action. And so if I was doing a scene, I didn't think to myself, gosh, I wonder what color my hair is. I knew what color my hair was. Either I was given a wig or I had the hair that was growing out of my head. So I had to figure out what am I doing? What am I doing? If I'm doing a thing, I know how I feel about it. And so if I had to cry, I had to do something that involved an emotion that got me to tears. And so like as an actor and then later as a screenwriter, I was always thinking, what am I doing? What am I doing? As a director, as I started to direct in my 20s, actors would come to me and they'd say, well, what am I doing? Like, what is my intention? What is my action? What is my action? So when I came to romance fiction and everyone would say, I would say things like, what can you tell me about your character? And they would say, well, he's really muscular and he has a huge penis and hazel eyes. I would say, but what does he do? Like, what does he actually do? And what I did in, as a screenwriter and what I continue to do in genre fiction is I start from the action of the characters. Mm -hmm. And action for characters cannot be described by anything other than an active transitive verb. What characters do is what they are. And so Darcy may be described as being handsome, may be described as being tall, but that's actually all Jane Austen says about him. What Darcy does on every page makes Darcy Darcy. And so what Darcy does, I believe, in Pride and Prejudice is preserve. He preserves on every page of that book. Every time he's in a scene, he is preserving. Mm -hmm. And sometimes people will say, well, a character can't just be one word. And I agree, because what characters have is an action that lasts for an entire book, and then they have tactics. And that is that action broken out into a series of synonymous reactions that I call tactics, which are based on different situations they find themselves in. So Darcy preserves for all of P&P. But over the course of the book, he admonishes, he withdraws, he withholds, he guards, he protects. He does all these other things which are kinds of preserving. And the irony about working this way with verbs, with verbalizing a character, is that what you're actually doing is giving audiences exactly what they get in their own lives. Because when you meet a person, you don't say, I wonder what color his eyes are. Now I know him. What you say to yourself is, well, how does he act? What does he do? And by knowing how a character acts, you actually begin as a human being to develop feelings about the way that character acts. And so in a way, like it both hijacks the way people learn about people in their own lives mm -hmm. and 
it actually connects directly to the writing process because you cannot write soprano. You can write a verb. A verb is a word. And so when I cast a character, I don't cast based on a bunch of like stupid traits or quirks. And I don't start with like, gosh, I think he's a trickster character or she's an anti-hero. I start with a verb and the verb is the core. And from that, I can extrapolate some things. If I want to start from the verb and write the verb, and then I think, I think this kind of character might be a redhead. I think this kind of character might be Polynesian. It's based at the core on action, which means everything aligns about the character, which also wastes much less time. Whenever I teach a class, I'll have students and I'll, uh, you know, I say to students, how many of you use questionnaires? You know, where you sit down and you're like, what was your first date? How tall are you? What's your religion? What's, you know, what side of the pants do you put your genitals? Like whatever it is. And they'll say all these things. And then I say, great, how much of that stuff do you use? And they're like, 2%, right. 4%. It's a waste of time. But if you start from the action, then every other choice you make about that character is aligned with their action. And that's much more efficient. You do not cook dinner by aiming a flamethrower at your kitchen. You actually align the ingredients in a pot and cook it because it's less wasteful. Right. And so for me, verbalizing a character is this sort of simple core idea. And when I, so I did this speech, well, speech because I'm a talker, obviously, <laughs> when I was in San Diego and I taught this class, I sort of did this fast riff on it for about 15 minutes. And Kristen Higgins stood there with her mouth open for like 30 seconds. And she was like, I've never heard of that in my life. And I said, well, everybody does this. Here's the secret. I actually think every writer in the world already does this. Right. I just think they believe because of writing guides that all this other, I call them impersonal ads, all these other questionnaires and archetypes and psychological whatever, they think they're using that. But what they're really doing is trying to get at character action. Character has to act. I love that. I love so much about that. And I'm glad you mentioned the impersonal ads thing because that phrase, I actually wrote it down. It really resonated. Oh, good, 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 good. You, good, good. you also wrote, if you write a mannequin, don't expect a heartbeat, which is just the perfect way of putting that. Hey. You know, if, if oh, you're just great. writing the details instead of the actions, yeah, all you get is an archetype. Well, it's funny because when you talk to people who are career writers, right, people who've been doing this for a bunch of years and they've written millions of pages, right, what they'll say to you is, it's so hard until I know what they need to do. But the minute I know what the characters need to do, I can write the scene. And I think, well, of course, think <laughs> like an actor. If you're an actor, no one says to an actor, so how big are your breasts going to be? Like, no one cares about that. What they say is, what do you have to do? What do you have to get? What are your goals? What are the actions approaching that goals? What are the motivations for the actions approaching those goals? Mm -hmm. So any kind of writer in any genre, if you start from this is what I have to do, it actually just makes your job so much easier. And it right. speeds everything up, right? Yeah. It facilitates. Another thing I really wanted to make sure we called out from that book is another thing from your background in film, which is to really cut down on extraneous everything, extraneous scenes, extraneous characters, like anything that is not serving the purpose of the story should go because it's not serving an action, right? It's not doing anything. And that comes from a very practical standpoint, not wasting money right. <laughs> on a big studio project. But when you translate that over to the writing process that is so useful and i'll tell you you know like i love a big messy book i love mm -hmm. george rr R. martin i can read dickens till the cows come home i mm -hmm. love a big sloppy 19th century narrative that's great the thing is those narratives even the big unwieldy ones with a zillion characters every character serves the action every character is there for reason the trouble is because the root of the novel is in those 19th century narratives, a lot of modern writers forget how educated and how precise the average 19th century novelist was. <laughs> Dickens was not creating a lot of characters for kooky what-what. He was thinking, how do I move this forward in this episode of the serial? And so like in film, every actor I add to the screen is gonna cost me 60 to 150 grand at a base, right? At a minimum, not even stars, just human beings on camera. Well, in fiction, there's a cost. It's not the cost. I mean, I'm not having to obviously pay somebody to do it, but I'm actually taking page count, word count away from characters that matter. And so if I'm going to give you a 15-page digression about the waitress serving me cheese, then I have stolen attention. I've stolen eyeballs from every other character in the story. And I've also stolen tension and emotional payoff. And the reader starts to resent it because they are the ones that pay. They are paying 
attention. That's why we say pay attention. They are investing attention in these characters. And so when you do have a cast of thousands or you do have weird backstory, digressions, flashbacks, what you're doing is charging your readers for the gift of your entertainment. <laughs> and they resent it. They start to feel like, hey, I paid for this. Entertain me. Make me feel something. Uh, like I say, I love a cast of thousands, but if you're going to do it, you better be a maestro. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you, better, you better be right in there. That's amazing. And I think another thing I really loved about the book is really the honor that you give to the reader and the importance, right? Like, when you're looking at publishing right now or you see how much money some people are making off of romance and have been for quite a while with the, the whole digital side of things, it can be tempting just to like get in it for the money and think that you're, you're going to make a good living off of this readership. But obviously there's, there's all kinds of things we could break down and problems in that method of thinking, but you know, that, you have to be educated on the genre and respect the readers and the fight for the reader's attention is something we talk about at Kobo all the time, right? In terms of so getting critical. readers to love books, right? Like you're not fighting against other books even, you're fighting against other modes of entertainment. Like what's going to make someone crack open their e-reader versus turn on Netflix at the end of a long day, right? Like it's going to be those characters at the end of the day, pulling them back into the story. Well, you know, it's funny when you talk to people about marketing, they will often say, well, I gave away a free paperback and no one downloaded it. Do you know the average rate of return on <laughs> QRC codes is under a half a percent for right. people with free downloads, right? Yeah. And they'll say, but it's free, but it's free. And the answer to that is the cost is not the money. The cost with a book is the time. I can pick up a television remote and watch three hours of Judge Judy and I have no investment but the time looking at it. But with a book, depending on what my reading level is, that can be 12 hours, 20 hours, 50 hours of my life. And so you have to earn the investment of their attention. Mm -hmm. It's funny. I had a friend who dated Carol Burnett for many, many years. Mm -hmm. And so I was very, very lucky enough to have had dinner with her several times. And Carol used to have this thing that she would say, the audience is never wrong. They're not always right about why they're right. They can't always give you a critique, right? Because they're an audience. But the audience loves things for the right reasons. Your job as an artist is to figure out why. Your job as an artist is to figure out what goes wrong. The audience saying, I love this, is a lesson for an artist. And that's why when people sort of slag off books that are, let's say, rockier in the writing, like, mm -hmm. I don't think that Twilight is full of deathless prose. I don't think Fifty Shades of Grey will be remembered in a thousand years. But I'll tell you something, those books are monuments to storytelling of a certain kind. And that's not to denigrate them. I think that those women are savvy, skilled genre writers. What I draw from those books is the lesson of these have earned the attention of millions of human beings. They have literally changed minds and hearts. What is the thing that they do? And so rather than thinking of them as something that's you know sort of trashy or pointless or eroticized or whatever it is, I'd rather think, what do they get right? Because there's a lesson in everything, right? There's mm -hmm. a lesson from them. And so if I can dig in and find the thing that earns those eyeballs, well, then I grow from it. That's a benefit. And that's true of anything. My mom used to say, there's no one so stupid in the world you can't learn something from them. And so my <laughs> deal is, I don't care if it's the junkiest, like pulpiest porn from the 19 teens. I want to know why it got bought, why the readers were interested, what made them turn the page, because there's a lesson in it. And I'm an omnivore, man. Like, I'll read anything. I am a genre slut. You put it in front of me, I want to figure out what makes it tick <laughs> to take the watch apart, right? Right. So anytime people say, like, Ugh, that's just a uh, insert whatever genre they're trying to denigrate, I think, well, that's stupid because you learn something from every genre. Every genre, every writer, every voice has something of a lesson, whether it's how to do something or how not to do something, right? Like yeah. you can always learn. Yeah. Love it. And I would highly recommend checking out that book. We will put the link to it in the show notes because I found it to be really, really useful. Even if authors don't know that they're doing it and they're already doing no, it. No, we I all verbalize. Just, yeah. You verbalize. You verbalize stories. I should also mention in the next month or so, I have a thesaurus coming out. My students have been hammering on me to do awesome. this. I did a dedicated thesaurus of transitive verbs for, and it's actually divided three ways, alphabetically, by genre, and by direction. And it is two 
247,000 words long. I have got 5,200 separate transitive verbs, and then it's divided across 3,200 separate entries. It's quite large, but, <laughs> but they were demanding it, and nobody had done this and created a listing of actions for authors. So I wrote yeah. it. That's coming. So yeah, then that's called Activate, I should say. That is called Activate. So Verbalize is out now, and Activate is coming. The other book I wanted to just mention um, that you also sent my way was Your A-Game. And that's a really stellar guide that's more of a platform approach, but you do touch on a a bunch of that stuff and verbalize as well. Um, What was the impetus for writing that book, which is a bit of a broader approach to marketing in a way? That's really a promo book. Yeah, Yeah. so that book started as a troll. <laughs> Ironic. I got a Facebook message from a woman and I will, I'm going to paraphrase and, and keep it brief as much as I can. She wrote me a message and she said, hello, you don't know me. Our books are listed as also buys on Amazon. I've planned a 61 stop blog tour. These are your stops. I need the posts in two weeks. And I wrote back. Exactly. I love your expression. <laughs> Um, so I wrote back and I said, thank you so much. I'm under contract for two books. I don't have time to write 60 blogs, but thank you. I really appreciate it. Best of luck. And she wrote back and said, fuck you. How dare you refuse my help? I've d- Do you know how much work it takes? Do you know how difficult this is? And I literally thought, oh, sh- she's a little like unhinged, right? A couple tacos short of the enchilada special. And I wrote back and I said, listen, you know, no offense, but I literally no every day, but I don't have time to participate in your promo. Thank you so much. And she wrote back and got angry and angry. And finally, I blocked her, right? Yeah. So I got off the phone and I called my friend Heidi Cullinan. And she also writes gay romance. So we're in the same niche and we often do a lot of cross promo. And we were talking and I said, oh my God, I just got this message you're not going to believe. And she said, let me guess, 61 stops, blog Mm -hmm. tour. And I started laughing. She said, yeah, she did it to me too. She's done it to about three of us, right? And this is the sort of people who make the most money in this sort of niche of romance fiction. And so Heidi said to me, I can't believe this is so ridiculous. And she said, you know what we should do? We should do a blog post about how to approach someone that is have, that's in your niche. How do you approach them in a way that's positive? And so I was like, yeah, yeah, let's do that. So we did what we always did, which is we open up a Google Doc and we both kind of barfed in a bunch of ideas. Well, about three days later, the article is 7,000 words. And I realized, okay, this is no longer a blog post. It's actually three blog posts. And then mm-hmm. Heidi was like, yeah, because to do that, we kind of have to explain what a brand is. Then to explain what a brand is, we have to explain what a presence is and what a platform is. Then we have to explain what marketing is, what an audience is. And as we kept writing, it kept getting longer and more elaborate because we realized to discuss the topic, we had to define our terms. But to define our terms, there was nothing in place that did this for genre fiction. There are a lot of books about marketing in general. And there are a few books about marketing books, Mm -hmm. but there are almost no books about marketing genre fiction. Now, there are a few more now than there were when this book came out. I think there's about eight, but the deal is the books that are, those eight books are very, very narrow in scope. They're either skewed, meaning like they really focus on one platform. They focus on Twitter, they focus on BookBub, or they focus Mm -hmm. on one thing, right? Or they're very, very general. There's in a general sense, they're like, promo is good. You should have a platform. People are nice. And so it drove us nuts because we couldn't find a, sort of a Goldilocks, like a happy medium between the two. And so we started saying, like, I think we got to write a book. And then we were like, as we wrote the book, we were like, oh, my God, this is going to be so gigantic. And in the course of writing it, about halfway into the writing, I called Heidi at home and I said, dude, this book is going to be too long. I was like, there's no way to break it into pieces because every piece connects to every other piece. And I said, you know what we have to do? We have to do a choose your own adventure. And she said, what are you talking about? And I said, well, if every author is different, and and this is sort of a core idea of ours, Mm -hmm. if every author is different, if every book is different, if every career is different, then how can marketing and promo and branding be the same for every person? It's not. We know it's not. And so then how do you write a book that is many books to many different people? And so this is how we wound up writing your A-game is we thought it needs to be fun. It needs to be positive. It needs to be proactive but it needs to be customizable for every single user. And so we went through and we created paths through it. So we divided by different types of writer, like different kinds of career, by different types of goal, by different types of experience, with the idea that 
you get to the end of the book, you can loop right back around to the beginning and reread it based on where you are now in your career. Mm -hmm. And so it's designed like a giant puzzle. And we wound up hiring play testers. We treated it like a game. We hired alpha and beta testers. We actually played out the game. There's something like, I think it's 1900 links in the book yeah. cut back and forth between. But so that's how it happened. It was a very weird fortuitous thing again actually i love it and i really was going to call out that it's it's a great read no matter what stage an author is at in their career it's a really solid refresh it's always important to you know every couple of years take a step back and look at your platform and say you know are my covers still from 2000 and right eight or whatever. <laughs> right. Or is my pen name doing its job or right. like, is this newsletter is strong? Well, you know, it's funny when we were thinking about the title, I kept talking about gaming cause I'm a game nerd. Yeah. And I said, the thing about your a game is it's your a game, meaning only you can do it. It's your a game, meaning it's the best you can bring, but it's your a game. Meaning if you don't have fun, you're not going to do it. You know, when people talk about, well, I do a lot of sort of promo teaching and when I talk to students, they'll say, oh, you know, it's so terrible, I don't have time. And I think, really, how often do you binge watch stuff on Netflix? You can spend nine hours watching The Walking Dead, but you can't spend 10 minutes on Facebook or on Twitter or on what Goodreads. <laughs> and the answer is people don't do it because it's not fun. I have right. a friend who's a comic and she used to say, look, I can do one sit up at the gym, but my girlfriend goes down on me, I can do a sit up for four hours. <laughs> and I feel like if you enjoy something, you are capable of doing it. And so my thing with the, any kind of promo is if the person can have fun, can find joy in it, then they will do it and do it with their authentic best self. And then it actually works. Right. <laughs> then you actually have the promo that you need to support the career you want. Mm, I love that. So we'll include that as well, because I really do think that's a worthwhile read. Absolutely. And I'm really glad that I was able to uh, experience that book through this conversation. So <laughs> good verb. That's a good love verb. Love it. <laughs> so I want to do a bit of a pivot now to, to look at like your brand and kind of how you put into practice the things that you talk about in both of mm -hmm. these books. So first on the topic of diversity, and I know that's a big one for romance in particular. And when you got started, what that looked like for you, I know like your first big bestselling romance was uh, a gay romance right that's all I write Hot, yeah. yeah I write I write gay romance so what have you experienced along the way in terms of you know growing your readership any obstacles you faced like any advice on that specific topic that you'd like to share I'll tell you when I first started everyone told me that gay romance was a niche they said look you're gonna make a fortune but it's this very narrow niche and you have to treat it a little bit like you're in the gay ghetto the way any city in the world has sort of like a, that gathering of bars and shops and restaurants where the LGBT community kind of gathers in right. urban centers, right? They call it in the gayborhood, right? <laughs> right? And so I said, yeah, that's great and all, but I actually, having come from film, I was like, I actually don't want to shoot myself in the foot and only sell to people that already want to buy my stuff. And I said, not to be gross, but I feel like those people are going to buy my book anyway. Mm -hmm. Don't I want to build readership? And they were like, what do you mean? And I said, well, if you look at bestsellers through history, every bestseller in the world, and I mean Peyton Place, Interview with the Vampire, Twilight, Fifty Shades, Hunger Games, they all start with non-readers. The way you build a bestselling career is not by selling to the people who already read books. It's by going and finding someone who barely can read and right. inspiring them so that you transform their lives. So they become readers. You bring readers, right? right? And the trouble is it's easy to kind of, it's, I call it being a hobo, like riding the rails on someone else's train. I write vampire books too. I write spanking books too, where you're writing some other book to success. Mm -hmm. But it, building tracks takes a different kind of effort. And so when I started out, I so I sold my book in, I think it was January of 2011, and I had this ticking clock because it sold very quickly, and it was going to come out in June of 2011, which was mm -hmm. also very quick. And my publisher was like, you know, I said, listen, I have sort of a promo plan. She was like, great, go with it. Let us know what we can do to help. And I immediately, I had already started doing the sort of Damon Sway branding, and I know a lot of what I know about marketing because of my experience in show business. I've been in show business since I was six years old. So I, before anything else, I immediately laid down the kind of the fundamentals. That's funny. I'm going to tell this sort of out of order because when I started, I didn't realize I was doing this, right. but then Faith Saley at CBS Sunday morning pointed out that I was doing 
what I do with my characters. I verbalized myself. And I now teach this when I'm doing a marketing class. If you think of yourself as your author self, as a character, don't you take action? Don't you have goals, motivations, and conflicts? Don't you have an intention? And so she said to me one day, this is about two years ago, she said, well, what's your action? What do you do all the time? What does Damon Swade do? And I said, oh, well, that's easy. Damon Swade energizes. I energize people. I energize rooms. I energize events. I energize situations. My action is to energize. And so going back to 2011, when I was laying on that basis, without even realizing it instinctively, I wrote myself as a character into the imaginations of those readers. I began taking on promotional opportunities. I set up accounts, everything with the intention of energizing things. I wrote a series of provocative articles for magazines. I went and did a bunch of television appearances, energize, energize, energize. And then in the same way with the character, you have tactics, right? I went in and the synonyms that I used as my tactics were things like stimulate, provoke, shock, surprise. And so every time I would do an event, I would think, how can I, I wasn't doing this consciously, but now looking back, I thought, how can I energize this? How can I provoke? How can I stimulate? How can I arouse? How can I wake? How can I startle? And so each of those things built Damon Swade as a character. Right. And so what I was doing was effectively verbalizing myself early on with a series of intentional actions that led to the goal, which was to make myself sort of a presence in, in, in the genre, in romance, but also in the larger world. Now, going back to diversity, I'm, I'm not forgetting your question. When I started out, they said, no, 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 you're going to be in this niche. And I said, I disagree. I said, I'm going to pretend that I already have the niche. So let's pretend the ghetto, the gayborhood is already going to buy me. I want to do mass market. Yeah. And they were like, that's impossible. There's no way. And I said, no, no, no. Y'all are red ocean. This is where the fish are already fighting over what I have. I want to go to the blue ocean. And they were like, but they hate you. They hate gay people. They hate gay books. This is impossible. And I was like, no, it's blue ocean because there's no one swimming there yet. I want to be the first. I want to get out there. And I shouldn't say the first because there have been other people that sort of made inroads. Right. But what I did, and I can't take credit for it, it was a combination of a book that was very well received, my personality fitting into a groove in the market at that moment, the mm -hmm. romance industry beginning to explode because of EPUB and self-pub. All of these sort of factors came together in one lightning strike. Because of that, I made a gigantic splash in numbers, in volume. And so suddenly, what was a very niche genre exploded. And if you go back and you look at the numbers, I actually have all this somewhere on my computer, Hothead was doing New York Times numbers. That, Hothead was my first book. Mm -hmm. Hothead started doing New York Times numbers before it even dropped. By the end of that summer, I'd been number one on gay romance for three months, right. but I was consistently in the top 50 on all romance on Amazon for I think two years, That's it just crazy. kept going. But what happened was, because I refused to be ghettoized, because I refused to say, oh, this is a diversity read and I'm gonna huddle in the corner with my pink triangle and my rainbow flag, what I said was, no, I don't write gay romance, I write romance. Right? And the gay is not a genre, gay is a trope, in the same way that pirates are a trope, or secret babies are a trope. I'm gonna write a book that gives you an emotional roller coaster that's satisfying. And yeah. whatever the parts are, whatever the meat is, is irrelevant. And what's funny is when the fans came back, and boy did they, the fans came back, they would say, I never would have read this book but it has changed everything. They did a survey actually about two years later. They surveyed 13,000 romance readers. And of the people who read gay romance, 46% of them, the first gay romance they read was Hothead. And so I know that that book, I cannot take credit for it, but I know that that book was a watershed because I got the numbers. Mm -hmm. And I think it was a watershed because by a fluke, I came from show business. By a fluke, I'm pushy and crazy. By a fluke, Damon Swade energizes, right? And so it was like I plugged in at the right moment with the right title at the right. But, you know, my mom always says uh, luck is opportunity plus preparation, right? Right, so, right. Love that quote. So the deal is I got lucky, but I got lucky because I had done all the prep. And then right. when the opportunities presented themselves, I was like, yep, I'll take one of those. Yep, that sounds good. Yes, Andy Cohen, I'll appear on Bravo. Yes, I would love to do the Tonight Show. Sure, I'll go do that radio spot. And so I just kept hustling, 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 as we all do, mm -hmm. because I had laid the groundwork. 
you know, I, I was going to say, not as we all do. I feel like not everybody does have that hustle in them. So if you ask indie writers, if you say, mm -hmm. what's the number one hardest thing you have to do, they'll say, oh, selling my book, promoting my book. And then I'll say, what have you done today to get you where you want to go? So let's say you want to be on the New York Times list or you want to be on The Tonight Show or you want to have, I don't know, a web series made out of your series. What have you done today that is a step towards that? Because what most people do is they sort of wait and whine about what's not happening instead of taking measurable steps towards the thing that's possible. And that takes patience and vigilance. And so it's that. It's, again, it's like characters, right? They're t taking action every day, doing something every day. On a similar note, you tweet a lot, which I love. And I do? Oh, God, I think I'm very quiet on Twitter. <laughs> Good. Yay. Thank you. You're engaged. On Twitter, I am engaged. And yes, I am you engaged engage in a lot of politics conversations. And I know so, some romance authors leave that untouched. Like they follow the don't talk about like, sure. money, politics, and religion or whatever. But you get right in there. Your opinion is out there. Has that always been, you know, a product of you being who you are? Or did, was that a conscious decision you made at, at one point? I think it's a little bit of both. Because I write LGBT romance, right? Specifically yep. gay male romance. I'm inherently political. I was actually doing an event down in North Carolina, this is about four months ago, and a woman, I'm assuming very conservative, she wasn't talking to me, she actually was very, very friendly to me, but she said, you know, I write romance, but it is not political like some people I could mention, and she sort of sneered at other people in her chapter. And I didn't call her out on it, but I thought about that moment a lot, because the other people she was calling out were kind of hurt by it, and I thought about it, and I thought, there's no such thing as non-political fiction. There's no such thing as unpolitical entertainment, because the assumption that one person deserves a happy ending, but another person doesn't, or the assumption that this is the right way to live and that's the wrong way to live is a political decision. And so, like, even the sweetest, gentlest, most candy-coated, fluffy romance in the world is an act of politics. Okay. Now, that's sort of the sort of, that's the academic answer, right? On the other hand, like, I'm a gay guy. And so if someone's gonna say to me like, gay, gay romance is evil, then I'm like, <laughs> well, then I guess you're gonna have to tattoo my wrist and put me in a camp because you want me dead. And they'll say, oh no, no, I just meant those books, they're wrong. I don't, you know, think of the children. The truth is they do wanna put me in a camp. And so it's very easy for me to be political because my books by their very nature excite strong emotions on either right. side, right? And so it's a funny thing. I do a regular column for Romance Writers Report called uh, A-Game Advice. It's actually been really fun. I really enjoyed it. But in A-Game Advice, one of the things that keeps coming up from letters that I'm getting from the, from the members is, what about politics? What about politics? And I actually want to write an article about it, yeah. but I know it's going to enrage people because what I'm going to do is call out that sort of passive sort of sideline sitting. By the same token, I'll tell you, I have a lot of good friends that write in very traditionally conservative genres, or in subgenres, I should say. Sweet romance, traditionally conservative. Christian romance, traditionally conservative. Westerns, traditionally conservative. Small town, right? All these things. Mm -hmm. So they're nervous about walking up to those lines because a lot of their readers believe that the idiot in the White House currently is doing something good and they don't want to lose those sales. And that's money. And I understand, like I was in the film business. I understand what it means to sell tickets and put butts in seats. At the same time for me, like I don't want to go into a concentration camp and have my wrist tattooed. It's easy choice for me to make. It's not a choice I cannot make. Right. Okay. But I also respect that some people have bills to pay and child support and medicine and things they've got to. So I, I think it's a personal decision. I think there's a lot of energy invested around it. And so you can tap into anger in both positive and negative ways. I'll tell you what makes me nervous about politics is when people who just rabble rouse for the sake of rabble rousing, meaning like they get off on the mob rage, yeah. use politics to shame others. I call it calling out instead of calling in. If I do something terrible in my book and you call me and say, Damon, look, I think that was kind of a crappy thing you did in chapter three. I wouldn't <laughs> use that language. It's sexist or homophobic or racist or whatever. And you called in, right? You called me directly. I could mm -hmm. say, oh, you know what? I agree or no, I disagree. But you and I are having a human conversation. Calling out is you going on Twitter and saying, God damn it. Look at Damon Swade. He's an asshole. And all of you should go and storm. I call that Castle Wankenstein. That's when a bunch of people grab their pitchforks and torches and march to Castle Wankenstein and throw rocks because they don't actually want to change anyone's mind. They want to have a big party with pitchforks and torches. Right. 
I sort of am aware of the landscape is what I'm saying. And I think that all of us, as in, we're part of the entertainment industry. I mean, fiction is a part of the entertainment industry. And I think we have to be conscious both of our bills, like we all have a job to do, mm -hmm. but also about each other's identities and our lives. And so I try to be respectful of other people. As a general rule, I personally, I try to not be negative of my colleagues, even if I disagree with them. Right. But if someone's a jerk or an asshole to someone that I care about, I'll call it out. So I think it's a, a line we all find. And mm -hmm. I think you have to find it in a way that's authentic to your books and your brand and your voice and your life and you know who you are. And then circling one last time back to the diversity question and kind of how things have changed between when you first launched Hothead oh my and God, today. So much. And also I wanted to just kind of wrap it up, I guess, by talking about RWA specifically because there have been questions about diversity within RWA and mm. how the organization represents diversity and all that. So how do you feel like the romance genre in terms of writing and readers is today? Do you feel it's inclusive? <laughs> I would say it is vastly more inclusive than it was even two years ago. Mm -hmm. I think that there are major strides. The metaphor that people often use for RWA is a cruise ship or a battle cruiser. It takes a very <laughs> long time to turn. It is slow and massive, but once it's going in a direction, it's unstoppable. The trouble is that for a stretch of mm, 10 to 15 years, RWA as an organization was always looking backwards. They were always looking in the rearview mirror at what had been accomplished of how far they'd come. And I'll tell you something, and I sh this is the caveat, I am a, a man in a woman's industry. And I mean that with all respect. I am so honored to get to work with these talented, brilliant, funny women mm -hmm. who laid the track, right? And so I'm super conscious of being a dude in a woman's world. But having said that, there is progress and there is museum duty. And I think for a long time, RWA was obsessed with the idea of being respected and preserving what already existed, what had already been put in place. And there came a point around the time of e-publishing because e-publishing accomplished many things. It fractured the hegemony of New York publishing, Not didn't right. destroy it, but it changed it. If I want to read about amputee Nazi mermaids, I can find a romance about amputee Nazi mermaids. If I want to read about chipmunk shifters, somewhere out there someone is writing <laughs> chipmunk shifters because EPUB changes the metric, right? right? And at that exact moment, when EPUB and self-pub and indie pub started shifting that market focus, that obsessive sort of monolithic market, a bunch of people started saying, I think it's weird that these books aren't put on shelves. I think it's weird right. that I'm not allowed to write about these things. I'm not allowed to read about these things. And those questions had reverberations. And so when I entered in 2011, I was the beneficiary of years of people asking questions that made it possible mm -hmm. for LGBT romance to exist in the RWA space. Now, ironically, the Rainbow Romance Writers, which I'm a member of, was founded years before I started even writing gay romance. Gay romance yeah. existed, I should say. The difference is at the time and even now, the majority of people writing LGBT romance are straight white women. Right. That is shifting, but it largely written by people who were not own voices. I think that the reason that my book and my career became sort of a flashpoint is because I was on Voices. Mm -hmm. And it's not that there weren't other gay men writing. I think that it was a confluence of many strands, right? But I do think there's a giant shift both in publishing as a whole and in RWA as an institution. Because mm -hmm. RWA has always come down on the side of inclusivity and tolerance, always. Every time some bigot has stood and said, one man, one woman, only this, there is no such thing, only marriage, only Christians, only white people, the RWA membership has clapped back hard and said, mm -hmm. nope, back of the room. And that makes sense. We have an entire right. genre predicated on the idea that relationships are powerful. We're not going to tell someone, no, you're not allowed to be happy. Our job <laughs> is to come up with happily ever after. So we are naturally optimistic. Romance is the literature of hope, right? So right. who are we to deny hope? At the same time, I do think that for a long time, it was easy economically to say, no, these systems in place make billions of dollars. These systems in place protect billions of copies of books sold. And as that started to fray at the edges and people began to see the money that was being made by people who didn't write inside the system, that didn't write sort of white, straight, Christian, heteronormative, all these other isms, 
And they realized, oh, you know, there are brown people who fall in love and there are disabled people who fall in love and there are older people who fall in love and actually sometimes three people fall in love. As soon as you start dissolving these boundaries Mm -hmm. and HEA is more flexible, then RWA has to respond. And so over the last, I've been a member since, I think I joined in 2010. Mm -hmm. And so that's eight years ago and I'm on the board now. (laughs) And that happened by accident. (laughs) <laughs> Seriously, in 2015, 16, Diane Kelly called me and she said, I want you on the board. Two people had had to pull out of the board. She said, I want to appoint you. And I was like, no, nah, I don't want to. She was like, no, 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 I'm serious. She was like, diversity and we think. And I was like, no, I don't believe you. And I called her. I was like, I don't believe you. I think this is all lip service. I don't want to be the token gay best friend. No, thanks. And she said, just think about it. Just think about it. And my husband was away working on a murder case and he came home. And, and when he came home, we had this long talk and he said, I'm calling you out. I think you're a fraud. And I was like, what are you talking about? And he said, I think this is exactly what you need to do. He said, I think you need to put your money where your mouth is. Get off your butt. Go in. Do the work. And he said, but let them know you're going to fight for the stuff that you care about. And so I did. And so Farrah Rashawn and I came in. That was, I think, three years ago, four years ago. And already work was starting to happen for sort of diversity and inclusion. And we were part of the boards that kind of pushed that forward. And we made mistakes and we did stuff that pissed off a lot of people. But the organization has shifted. Even now, the organization has shifted so much. And we get letters every day from people that will say, I thought I was invisible. I thought no one saw me. I thought there was no happy ending for me. And what could be more romantic than finding hope as a writer, right, for your own HEA? And so it's been really cool. I mean, I'm, I have so much respect for the women that run RWA and getting to be on this. It's been one of the greatest blessings of my life. And it sounds weird because you'd think like, oh, committees and paperwork and minutes, or whatever. But it's so inspiring to know the industry from the inside and to see the numbers and to watch the change at every level, sort of incrementally as things, because it is like a stalactite. It's drip by drip, grain by grain. We're building these sort of mansions of the heart. And and RWA works so hard. And, you know, a lot of people will say, well, is RWA still relevant? Like in the era of Me Too, in the era of e-publishing, why is RWA still relevant? Perfect example is Cocky Gate. I don't know how aware people are of cocky gate, but when that went down last year, a woman tried, for those of you who don't know, a woman tried to trademark the word cocky and it created this huge kerfuffle in independent publishing and RWA put $50,000 towards a lawyer to fight it. You cannot do that as an independent author. I mean, unless some independent author I don't know about wants to drop 50K for a lawyer, RWA is capable of making these kind of big moves and negotiating with Amazon and talking to the Authors Guild and going to Congress to talk about copyright. And the staff, Allison Kelly, who's the executive director, and the staff, Carol Ritter and Steph Fry, Aaron Fry, the work they do is so astonishing because they do love the industry and they do care about it. It gives us a lever that we can never have on our own. So I'm really, I'm a true believer. I really am. I'm a, I'm a, a company man because RWA is always about the professional interests of career-focused romance writers. And they put their money where their mouth is and put their mouth where their money is. <laughs> well, I hesitate to end on that note, but I... Respect your time, but we could end it with... You already gave what I really love as a great piece of advice for any writer listening, which is, you know, what have you done to achieve your goals today? Um, Do you have anything else that you think helps you guide your kind of daily writing when you get up every day or when you Absolutely. I'll tell you, because I've been writing now for 30 plus years and Mm -hmm. I really do set out with this sort of one thing a day, one thing a day forward. So I can always look and say, even if I moved an inch, I'm an inch closer than I was before. If I always move in a direction. Well, the one thing, and this actually comes from theater. I use something I call the measure of success. And it's something I picked up in directing shows is that you can't control reviews. You can't control your output. You can't control when the muse shows up. But what I'll do when I'm starting any project is I set up a measure of success, like a goal. And I get to pick and it is specific to me. It is, it is measurable. It's achievable based on my assets and resources right now. It's relevant to what I care about. And it's timely, right? It's something that I've got a schedule for. And so everything that I'm working towards, I know that that measure of success is possible, right? So I establish that measure of success and then every day I can look and say, 
Did I get closer? Did I move nearer? And so I would say if there's one piece of advice I give you, everything you do, whether it's getting your pages done for the day, worrying about the shape of your bookmarks and the artwork on them, figuring out your cover, deciding on a pen name, is establish a measure of success so you can hold yourself accountable because you're allowed to fail. Failure is part of success. You have to fall down. Lillian Gish once said, what we call failure is not the falling down, it's the staying down. But if you have a measure of success, you can always pick yourself up and move towards your real goal, the things that matter to you. Wow, I got chills a little bit Oh, there. that's thank nice. Thank you. <laughs> good, good, good. Perfect. And thank you. What an awesome conversation. Thank you for sharing your oh, and energy you and your knowledge and awesome trajectory in this crazy industry with our listeners. I really appreciate it. No, and thank you so much for having me. And write hard, guys. Write great books because I need to read them. Awesome. Thank you, Damon. Thank you very much. So we hope you enjoyed our interview with Damon, not my interview, Chrissy's interview with Damon. Make sure to check out the blog because we'll have links to his titles that we definitely suggest you check out. Yeah. And if you have written in different kinds of niches of romance or whatever genre you write in, share your stories with us. We would love to hear about them. And if you have a story to tell in terms of breaking ground in your genre or finding a new way to inspire your writing, we'd love to hear from you. Email us at writinglife at Kobo.com. Or share on social. Whatever. Thank whatever you want. Whatever you want. We're here to listen. And thank you for listening to us. As always, we totally appreciate your time and dedication to listening to us here at the Kobo Writing Life Podcast. Thank you. Bye. For listening to the Kobo Writing Life podcast, where we provide insights and stories from leaders and experimenters in the world of self publishing. If you want even more information about growing your Kobo sales, check out our blog or find us on social. And if you're just finding us and ready to start your self publishing journey today, sign up for free at kobo.com/writinglife. Until next time, happy writing! <laughs>